moving on to the next session, which is a talk on geospatial and AI, the new, the now, and the next. To talk on the topic, we have with us Jay Theodore, Chief Technology Officer, ESRI. As a CTO, Jay guides the long-term vision for the ArcGIS platform. Jay is passionate about harnessing innovative ideas to increase the value companies gain from location intelligence, geoscience, computer science, and technology. Pleasure to have you here with us uh, this morning, Jay. Over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Justin. I'm really glad to join this uh, AI summit and talk to all of you. I'm going to talk about geospatial and AI, how they can work together, shape the future of our world, of your world. And we work from 20 R&D centers across the world. I'd like to highlight one of them in New Delhi, which is where all the geospatial AI work is being done. Our world has many challenges. It impacts all of us. Take, for example, aging infrastructure and congested cities, pollution and climate change. There's water crisis alongside wildfires. There's also recent challenges like the pandemic itself that we are still in. These are all challenging our sustainability. It's threatening our future. We need to understand our world better. We know very little of it. Our world is very complex. We are very interdependent across ecosystems and it's rapidly changing and evolving. Changes caused by human activities and decisions. Sustainability and innovation fundamentally requires that we see the world as one single ecosystem. Geography, the geographic approach, provides the science and the language to achieve this. It provides a framework for understanding and applying our knowledge collectively. For example, environmental systems, how they connect to and work alongside and impact economic systems and social systems not looking at them as independent entities, but bringing them all together. When you do that, when you organize and integrate all the factors, it eliminates patterns. We can discover new relationships. This is what we call the geographic approach. Today's modern GIS embodies that approach in a very comprehensive and integrated geospatial system, like you see here. And we infuse AI into all aspects of this GIS whether it's mapping and location services, analytics, imagery, or providing a developer experience. There are a few examples of uh, outputs from such a system that you see here on the right. And being able to access this from anywhere, whether it be in the cloud, through the web, into edge devices, mobile devices, and so on. Our goal with bringing geospatial and AI together is to help address some of the most complex challenges. It starts with understanding our world. That's the foundation for mapping a common ground. And then finding innovative ways to create a sustainable future in each of the areas that we see listed here. Such a system starts always with data, being able to access all kinds of data that includes structured and unstructured, uh, LIDAR data, for, for example, imagery, uh, being able to work with 3D, CAD, BIM, big data, real-time IoT data, and most recently graph data too. And being able to go from what the data is to what the information could be, uh, going from one model to another. And as you do that, delivering it the right way for the right experiences and workflows that users of the system are looking forward to. Now, I'd like to bring your attention to a few examples here. As you can see, there are edge devices, mobile devices, desktop, and the web, and so on, providing those experiences, and even notebooks for data scientists. Talking about scale of disseminating this information, what you see in the center is a John Hopkins dashboard reporting COVID cases across the globe. To date, we've had 1.3 trillion hits on this site. Let's define what the scope of geospatial AI is. GeoAI, as I shorten it in some cases, it applies spatial machine learning and deep learning techniques to help solve often very complex problems and derive deeper insights in very powerful and innovative ways. 
It really expands the power of GIS to support two kinds of systems. One is, you can call it assisted intelligence where human is in the loop. The other is building fully autonomous systems. And to achieve that, there's a model for an end-to-end -end geospatial system, like you see here, where the inputs are coming from satellite imagery or drone or camera data. Now, being able to democratize AI has been very fundamental to a lot of recent inventions in this area. It starts off with being able to have the core of it, which is an API, often for data scientists who are able to code in Python, a learn module, and then there's encapsulating that within tools and web services for easy consumption by applications. There's also ready to use GeoAI models, pre-trained models that are made available. And then there's GeoAI powered applications. Let's jump in and see a few examples of machine learning, deep learning, and AI. It's really GeoAI being able to embed that across the geospatial system. You have the toolbox, you have the pre-trained models, and then there is automated machine learning. There's also the integrated user experiences and being able to access open source uh, so that you can have the latest and greatest. Uh, there are a few examples like you see here, uh, the outputs from some of these models. And then there's being able to have the tools and app experiences like the Deep Learning Studio, where multiple collaborators can work on labeling the data and then being able to massively scale the inferencing and getting the outputs from that. And then you have pre-trained models made available through the Living Atlas. We'll take a look at a few of these. Like you see here, they are categorized and cataloged for your convenience. So you can see dozens of them, like you see here in this uh, demonstration. Uh, you have building footprints that can be used across. There's land cover. There's also mangrove classification like you see here. Now, here are a few examples of those outputs. It talks about the accuracy of these, uh, what geographies you can apply that in, in. It also goes through the training data that was used to train this model. And uh, as we go through these examples, you might identify the Sundarbans. Um, so you can use this across different parts of the world in this particular case. And then there's road extraction. Um, the road extraction model here has similar metadata in terms of the inputs and the outputs. Now, what do these models do? Here's an example of building footprint extraction uh, working within the US. Um, the same model uh, with a little bit of uh, retraining working in Africa and doing quite well like you see here. Here's the example for road extraction. Uh, what you're seeing is a story map of all of these models. Um, you can go and check it out in each of these categories. The most advanced way of using uh, this technology is by having access to the Python API. There's a learn module that lets you do everything, um, including uh, being able to fine tune some of these models um, and do automated machine learning. There's also model explainability. Uh, it's an emerging area that we feel is pretty critical to get wider acceptance of these models. I'd like to take you through a few examples of GeoAI being applied to real world problems. Chain detection is a very common one where you want to detect changes like changes caused by disasters or changes caused by urban developments like you see on the right bottom here. Road cracks on the pavement, on the surface of the road, is classified uh, based on what types of cracks they are and what the size is and so on, uh, and which ones have to be fixed right away so you can have a dispatch crew uh, going and fixing that. On the left bottom, you see the dashboard that represents those, and it's just using a standard uh, GPS-enabled GoPro camera for that. On the right, what you see is forecasting in advance so that you can go and do preventive maintenance to maintain the conditions of the roads. Creating and maintaining a digital twin can often be a cumbersome process. Now, in this case, GeoAI is helping us automate that process of both creating and keeping it up to date. And then there's end-to-end -end workflows by utility companies, like in this case that you see here, 
flying drones to see how um, transformers and poles and trees are uh, there as assets in their system and how they're impacting each other, uh, being able to identify, like you see on the right side, any defects that are there, comparing and contrasting against the baseline of what they should be. But all of this requires a complete system, a GIS system and an AI system that work together in a unified single system, right from planning your routes, whether it be the route for the drone or the route for the camera on board a vehicle, and then being able to store that data leading to analysis, uh, where you run these models to detect these assets, find the differences, find the defects, and then being able to summarize that information through dashboards and also being able to send uh, inspection tasks for crew on the field uh, based on the priority. And then there's advancements with uh, natural language processing being used for text analysis, for entity extraction, where you go from text to spatial data, like you see there. Now I'd like to go to two places in the world. The first one is Indonesia, where the forestry department has a very interesting use of deep learning. Now there's a need as contractors do the work of uh, harvesting lumber across thousands of hectares of land, hundreds of thousands of hectares of land, uh, being able to identify loss of wood and differentiating it from wood residue, which is okay to leave behind. Uh, this is an environmental and an economic challenge. And running the model to accurately detect the woods. And then being able to use GIS tools to find, to first label it and calculate the dimensions based on uh, the criteria that was set. And here you see the differences between the uh, wood residue and the wood loss being identified red versus yellow. And being able to use this to not just evaluate the contractors and their work, but how to help improve productivity and hence increase revenue. Uh, so this is the uh, output of the wood detection tool uh, for using, that uses GeoAI. And another forestry example is to identify trees and count them across 2 million hectares of land. It's used for many purposes, planning is one of them. And then being able to predict the demand versus available stock, uh, given that uh, uh, the, it's, we are in challenging times of trying to solve the supply chain problem. So you take the input image, you use the tree detection model, you count the stock and the maturity, and you can also classify for further action, like you see here, you know, which ones are uh, requiring inspection on the ground where you send a field crew versus which ones are declining in health uh, versus the ones that are doing well. So this is going to give you the required uh, inputs for the decisions that you need to make. Next, I'd like to take you on a tour of application of GeoAI in India. My first example is land parcel extraction in Andhra Pradesh. This is an end-to-end -end system. Here's an example of buildings extracted in different parts of Maharashtra. This is using the same model in the Noida area. This is the automatic road extraction uh, creating the road network in Nagpur, tree count model in Noida again, and being able to present that in a dashboard, classifying across small, medium, and large canopies, getting the total tree count, and so on. Here's an example of pothole detection in Meghalaya. This is an interesting one, uh, because at first I didn't understand exactly what the use was. Uh, I understand now that it's an indication of electricity theft if there are loose wires in rooftops, in terraces, and identifying them manually using imagery is very time consuming. So this is able to detect the buildings with and without wires on top and classify them using a deep learning model. Here's an example of feature extraction as used uh, within the railways. As we know, uh, the railways in India is very extensive and it's a lot of manual labor to be able to go look at the um, cantilevers on the railway track and the power lines and the poles and so on. Um, not just to identify them, but to measure them and so on. So th we created a few um, pre-trained models and uh, it does both uh, class detection and classification, like you see here. It's an end-to-end -end, uh, systematic workflow. Um, 
and the input is from LiDAR point clouds. There's application of GIS within this workflow uh, using geoprocessing tools that extract the dimensions. Uh, so it's the dimensions of the cantilever and uh, everything else around that. Uh, extending this, it can also be used to detect encroachments in railway land like you see here and acting upon it. Here's an example of an edge detection model that can be used to identify the tracks and extract them through post processing and use that as your system of record, your digital twin. Uh, sometimes some of these are in the original format in paper and this is a way to digitize them. Secondly, it's a way to keep them up to date. This is the full um, automatic extraction uh, model that was used for this purpose. Looking ahead and uh, seeing what are the advances that we made in the recent past that are coming to light, the first one I'd like to share is few shot detection, DETREG. Uh, on the left, what you see is a model that was trained using 20,000 chips. That's a lot of work as compared to the one with just 100 chips. So if you have just a small set of training data, uh, this kind of technique is very good. And then lastly, I'd like to share panoptic segmentation, which is using a model that can solve multiple problems. Like in this specific case, it's doing land cover classification, building footprint extraction, uh, and swimming pool detection, for example. Uh, panoptic means everything that you see, you know, get the job done in one go. That's what you see here. It saves a lot of time and effort. And then there's a lot of data being collected in the form of oriented imagery. The original intent was to use it for you know, street view visualization style purposes. But what we see is an emergence of using this in a fully automated manner to extract street furniture. Uh, like for example, uh, traffic lights. Not just the precise location of it, which is calculated using both deep learning and GIS, but also the dimensions that go alongside with it, the attributes of that asset. All that is possible from oriented imagery using deep learning. Now, that was just a few examples of GeoAI being adopted across the world, because what GeoAI is doing is connecting the data, the science, geography, and AI, and applying it to various kinds of problems it's infused, it's integrated, and working together. So there is hope for a sustainable future. It's just that we have to apply our best science, technology, and creativity to solve some of these problems that we identified earlier. And fundamentally, we think geographic thinking and UAI will be essential to accomplish this. So my call to action for you is, let's work together, innovate together. We are integrating and advancing geospatial and AI so you can address some of the world's greatest challenges, urgent challenges, right now. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for that interesting and insightful presentation. That was uh, Jay Theodore, Chief Technology Officer, Esri there. <music>